right, so freedom in Christ. We're in Luke chapter 4 this morning. Freedom in Christ. And so every year on July 4th, uh, we celebrate Independence Day. And we're blessed to live in a free country where we have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and so many other uh, freedoms that God has blessed us with. Um, it's not to be taken for granted, and I think a lot of people in our country right now are taking it for granted, uh, but may each of us uh, not take it for granted, and may we thank God for the freedoms that he's given us, and, and it's something that we can celebrate every day of the year. Um, the land of the free, one nation under God. But there are a lot of people in our world who are not free, uh, even those who call America their home. There are many people who are oppressed by the burdens that they carry. And without Christ, they are slaves to their sin. They have no hope. Uh, but there is hope. There's hope because there's freedom in Christ. And he, he gives us a freedom from our sins. He gives us new life. And since it's a mission as a, our mission as a church to reach out to those who need Christ, uh, let's look today at Christ's mission and see what he focused on and how he can help us as we tell others about the freedom that he offers, the freedom that comes only through Christ. So first of all, Jesus offers spiritual freedom. Luke chapter 4, let's read verse 16 to 21. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 says, Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So at this point Jesus had just been baptized and he had overcome the devil's temptation in the wilderness where um, he ate nothing for 40 days. And so now Jesus is in his first year of uh, his ministry. And uh, so he went to the synagogue in his hometown in Nazareth. Now synagogues were these places of worship where uh, teaching and reading would take place for, for the Jews. And so men would come there to learn about God, kind of like how we, we come to church today to learn about him. And uh, so volunteers would be allowed to read the scripture from scrolls of the Old Testament, especially if somebody came through who was a teacher, um, they, they would open it up for them to, to read. And so then after they read, they'd explain what that passage meant. So on this particular day, Jesus was allowed to read and explain a portion of Scripture. And of course, Jesus knew this passage. It was taken from Isaiah chapter 6, uh, 61, verse 1 and 2. Jesus knew that that passage spoke of him as the Messiah. And so that particular passage was special to the Jews because it pointed to the Messiah. It was a message of hope, of deliverance. It was a reminder that God was with his people. It was a reminder that God cared about his people. Um, so he, he wanted to explain to the people why he came, what the mission of his ministry on earth would be. And also it's important to note that the ministry of Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that happened after he was baptized. It says that the Spirit came down like a dove when the Father said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus wanted the people to know and understand that his ministry truly was blessed by God. And, and, and the good news that he spoke of came from God. Jesus is, an, is the Messiah. So in Hebrew that means anointed one. Uh, so God the Father sent him, uh, set him apart to do the work of bringing salvation to the entire world. And so he came to bring spiritual freedom. Uh, first to the poor. 
He came to bring spiritual freedom to the poor. I uh, said that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So, Jesus came to bring the good news of the kingdom of heaven. And the, the Greek word there for preach gives the idea of bringing good news with the intention of cheering up the hearer. So Jesus wanted to deliver all who would listen from their sin and set them on the right path. And so here specifically when he says the poor, he's referring to those who are humble and open to salvation. Um, Matthew 5, 3, Jesus calls uh, them poor in spirit. Um, the Greek word there for poor meaning to, to cringe or to shrink back, you know, to cringe or shrink back from your sin. So it gives us this picture of a beggar having a uh, one hand out and covering his face with the other hand, covering it in shame because of his condition. And you see, because of sin, all of us are completely impoverished. And that's why Christ came. He came to bring the good news. The good news to the poor. Um, the good news to those without it. And the, the poor who are spoken of here have minds that aren't polluted by the love of money, on riches and power. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Um, and that made me think of back when Jesus ministered to the rich young ruler. And that young man, he came expecting to be patted on the back uh, by Jesus and told what a great job that he was doing. But when Jesus told him to sell all that he had and give to the poor, Scripture tells us that he went away sad. Um, and uh, Jesus, it's not that Jesus didn't love the rich uh, as well and minister to them. He did take time to minister to the rich young ruler. Um, and Mark, it actually tells us that Jesus felt a love for him. So the point isn't that, oh, if you're rich, Jesus doesn't love you. Of course not. The point is that the meek spoken of by Jesus are more likely to hear the gospel, more likely to receive it. Um, throughout the Old Testament, we read, of, we read of how much God loves the poor or the humble. And Psalm 34, 6 says, The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his trouble. Psalm 68, verse 10 it says, your creatures settled in it. You provided in your goodness for the poor, O oh God. You know, a lot of times we read in Scripture of Jesus sitting down with the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes. It's because those people knew that inside they were sinners. And their hearts were humbled and they responded to Jesus because they could hear the love in his voice. And they understood that he offered them uh, hope, uh, a hope that they could find nowhere else. Next, uh, Jesus came to bring spiritual freedom to uh, the captives. Uh, spiritual freedom to the captives. It says, he says, uh, I've come to proclaim liberty to the captives. So he's referring to those who are held captive by sin. Uh, those who are prisoners of war, if you will. It, it's a spiritual bondage to the, uh, the guilt of sin. So Jesus saw them as sinners held captive in prison. And he wanted to release them. In Isaiah chapter 42, it says that they are in a dungeon. You know, sin is a power that no one can escape on their own, like a dungeon. And uh, Jesus said in John 8, 34, truly I tell you, Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Proverbs chapter 5 verse 22 says, His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. And that's why Jesus came, so that his victory over sin could give us victory. The gospel releases the mind that's held captive by sin. When you get saved, Christ cleanses your heart and your mind, it makes you into a new person. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things
things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Well, that doesn't mean that we won't face the struggles of sin anymore. But we're no longer held captive to sin because we belong to Christ. And his famous hymn, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, Charles Wesley wrote, He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. There's a story told of a young slave girl who was being sold at auction one day. She was a beautiful girl, tall and slender. The, uh, the bidding was keen and quickly mounted higher and higher until at last only two men were left bidding for her ownership. One of them being a foul-mouthed fellow who raised his bid every time to outbid the other. And the other man was a quiet man of refinement. Finally, the bidding stopped, and uh, the, the quiet, refined gentleman who had bid so very earnestly was, was given the papers which made him the lawful owner of the young girl. With a shove, the auctioneer presented her to her new master, and uh, proudly and defiantly she stood before him, hating him with every part of her being. But suddenly, a change came over her face. First, there was a look of pure amazement, closely by, uh, followed by one of utter disbelief, because her owner was ripping up the papers of ownership. And with a smile of kindness, he said to the trembling girl, My dear, you are free. I bought you that I might free you. You are set free. She was too stunned for speech, and so she merely steered it till finally with a cry of happiness too deep for words she cast herself at the man's feet and through her tears exclaimed oh master i'll love you and serve you for life well just just like that slave girl was set free was no longer a prisoner a slave you and i have been set free by the lord jesus christ set free from our sin bought by his sacrifice on the cross and set free from our slavery to sin. So Jesus offers spiritual freedom. Second, he offers emotional freedom. Jesus offers emotional freedom. Uh, first to the brokenhearted. Jesus says that uh, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now some of you were here when I proposed to Sherry from behind the pulpit here. Uh, and when I did, I read this scripture in Luke, and I, and I focused on uh, this part of the verse. Um, Jesus was sent to heal the brokenhearted. And uh, it's a very special verse to me because uh, I had a broken heart um, when I came back from Iraq and went through a lot. I had a broken heart, and uh, God brought Sherry into my life, and of course has given us five wonderful children. Now... There were many broken hearts in the world during Christ's ministry, and there are many broken hearts in our world today as well. And so Jesus wants to heal those broken hearts. When we think of a broken heart, there are different things that come to mind. Um, being crushed by grief, or being uh, shattered, or cut off, being stained by sin, being uh, infected or injured, the list goes on. It's this, this deep affliction they can't find comfort apart from Christ. You know, it's the kind of a, kind of affliction, the kind of brokenheartedness that uh, consumes you and it beats you up and uh, it leaves you in a, in a deep state of uh, despair or, or depression. And you're left bruised, you're left battered and defeated. And uh, a lot of times you'll turn to other stuff like alcohol or drugs or pornography or whatever to try to take away that pain. But that brokenness, but that doesn't take it away. Psalm 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and he saves such as have a contrite spirit. Psalm 147, verse 3 says that he heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their minds. Or, I'm sorry, he binds up their wounds. Jesus knew their pain, and he knows our pain too. How many people came to Jesus during his ministry who were broken and they knew nowhere else and they knew no one
one else to turn to, but he offered them hope, and so they turned to him. Now we only have a small portion of stories in scripture, but there are many more who came to him, I'm sure, that aren't recorded in the pages of scripture. And Jesus not only had uh, compassion for them, but he could heal them uh, through the power of God, and he could give them back their hope, he could give them back their joy. Uh, there are many people in our area here who have broken hearts. Um, the only one who can bring them comfort is Jesus Christ. And a lot of them turn to so much else, but none of that takes care of their pain. And we as Christians can be sharing his love with them and telling them about Jesus as the great physician and that he can and he will heal their broken hearts. God doesn't want us to be broken. He wants us he wants to make us whole. Jesus also came to heal the oppressed, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The word oppressed there also means bruised. Uh, Jesus is speaking of those who are oppressed uh, or bruised by the consciousness of sin. It's a pressure that's inescapable. It's like a huge burden on their backs and it just gets heavier and heavier. Some of you have probably read the Pilgrim's Progress before, and Christian is on his journey to heaven as a, as a new Christian, and he's got this huge burden on his back, and when he, when he goes before the cross, the burden falls off. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's sin. Sin is a huge burden, pressing down. Um, crushing us, the heaviness of our sin, being overwhelmed by the troubles that we're facing in this life. And there's, there's no way that, uh, that a person can lift it up, that burden of sin, can't lift it up on their own and bear it in their own strength. It's not possible. Psalm 38 verse 3 and 4 says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. What a, what a hopeless state to be in. And you know what? There are so many people in our world who are in that state. And a lot of people in our area are being crushed by their addiction to drugs or alcohol or being full of uh, lies or hate oppressed by their, their hate, bitterness, whatever it is. But guess what? Christ came to this earth so that they could have hope. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus doesn't want anyone to die uh, oppressed by their sins. Jesus can set anyone free, but they have to turn to him. Teen Challenge is a, a great organization that uses the love of Christ to help people overcome their, their drug and alcohol problems. And uh, Dan is one of those people who went to them for help. Uh, he was raised in an abusive home started using alcohol at a very early age. And when he completed high school, um, he had uh, several alcohol-related arrests, so he ended up joining the uh, Marine Corps. And shortly after enlisting, he was uh, deployed to Iraq. This unit lost 35 men total, and had about 450 injured. Everything from ruptured eardrums to missing limbs. And so Dan returned home uh, best up and returned home angry. After another deployment, he got heavier into drinking, and one of his friends died in Iraq. Another of his friends killed himself, and then his brother, who was also Marine, hung himself. So he became depressed. He got a divorce. He ended up in jail and treatment, and eventually he tried to kill himself. But then he went to a teen challenge, and he heard about the love of Christ, and it changed his life. Jesus freed him from that oppression to sin. 
that nearly crushed him to death. So Jesus offers a spiritual freedom to the oppressed. He offers emotional freedom. And third, Jesus offers physical freedom. He offers physical freedom. Now first he says recovery of sight to the blind. Recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus did this many times with people who were physically blind. For example, in Matthew chapter 9, there were uh, two blind men who, uh, who have, put, uh, have faith in Jesus and his ability to heal them. And so they go to him and he rewards them uh, with uh, healing their sight. He rewards their faith with sight. And another example, a man named Bartimaeus came to him, cried out, Son of David, have pity on me. And Jesus healed him because of his faith. But this is also speaking of those who were spiritually blind. You know, those who were uh, unsaved, unsaved people walking in darkness. They can't see where they're going. Psalm 82 verse 5 says, They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says, In, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. And the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But you know, there is hope. Ephesians 1.18 says, Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. During his ministry on earth, Jesus healed many spiritually blind people. For example, Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He cheated a lot of people. He was rich. Like earlier I mentioned um, uh, the rich young ruler who didn't turn from his sin. But here Zacchaeus cheated a lot of people, had a lot of money, but Jesus reached out to him, went to his home, and he was healed of his spiritual blindness. He then paid everyone back who he had cheated. You know, Jesus, he doesn't want to leave anyone in their blindness because a person who is spiritually blind will end up going into destruction. It leads to the destruction. And that's why Jesus included this as part of his mission, to uh, restore sight to the blind. Um, and then he refers to the acceptable year of the Lord, that being the, the year of jubilee or the year of release when the people of Israel canceled uh, their debts and they restored lands. Jesus came to deliver all people from their captivity to sin uh, and to bless them with um, salvation. Jesus was speaking of the age of redemption, uh, being the, uh, the age of grace that we're in now. Um, it started when he came and it continues until this day. Salvation. Deliverance is open to all people. But they have to receive that forgiveness that he offers. They must receive it. Well, in closing, I want us to remember that the same Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that has anointed each and every one of you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 says, You have an anointing from the Holy One. That means that we are filled with and we are blessed by the Holy Spirit um, because we have received the forgiveness that Jesus offers. We're part of the family of God. So because we have the Holy Spirit, we can have the boldness to tell people about the spiritual freedom and the emotional freedom and the physical freedom that Christ offers. Our area, you know, it's, it's so full of so many hurting people. There are many addictions, a lot of divorces, a lot of broken hearts, a lot of children from broken homes, many people who are oppressed. And sin has a stronghold in so many people's lives. They're held captive by the power of sin and it consumes them, it wants to destroy them. But Jesus Christ offers freedom. And Jesus has given each of 
bucks the good news and people around us who need to hear about it. Especially now as our country goes through so much, uh, so much, um, so many bad things, you know, with the riots and the coronavirus and there's so much pain and so many people hurting and just people need Jesus. So he's given us the good news. People around us need to care about it. Paul's prayer request in Ephesians 6.19 was pray also for me that wherever I, or excuse me, whenever I speak, that words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. That's a prayer that we all should have. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 says, Because through, through Christ... Excuse me, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We've been freed by from the power of sin. We've been freed from the power of sin, and now we belong to Christ. So let his love shine through you and be bold as you encounter so many hurting people uh, in our area. Tell them about the love that Jesus has for them and the freedom that only comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus loved the world so much that he came and gave his life on the cross for the sin of the world so that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not go to hell, but will have an eternity in heaven with Jesus. Let us pray. We love you so much, Almighty God, and we are grateful that... Uh, we belong to you. We're grateful, Lord, that, uh, that you've allowed us to be part of your family. Thank you so much for the freedom that only comes through you, freedom from our sin and oppression and brokenness. And Lord, only through you. I pray, God, that each of us would take that freedom and, uh, and go about and tell as many as will listen all about the freedom that comes through you, Lord. So those who are held captivity by their sin may come to you might be free by you. But give us boldness as we go about. Um, keep us close. We love you so much, Almighty God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we sing the final hymn, if anyone needs prayer or